So let's take a look at some potential targets for drug design. So let's look at some proteins that are well characterized to play important roles in signaling pathways. They're known to be mutated and perturbed in cancers. And let's see whether they are good targets for um, drug design. So does it make sense to target tumor suppressors as, um, at, with, with anti-cancer drugs? So we know that tumor suppressors contribute, contribute by cancer through their absence. Okay, so it's the absence of the tumor suppressors that lead to uncontrolled growth. So normally, in a normal cell, these proteins are involved in regulating growth and they're like the brake system in, in a car. Okay, so it's the absence of the tumor suppressor that leads to the cancer. Now, it's, um, it, it's implausible to develop low molecular weight compounds to replace missing functions. I mean, it's very difficult to think of a small molecule that you can put into a cell that's going to slow down the growth of the cell by replacing the function of a protein whose role was to slow down the growth. Okay, it's, it's just proteins are big complex things and it's difficult to replace them with a simple low molecular weight compound. Okay, now there's been a couple of minor victories in this regard. Maybe this is the exception that proves the rule. But um, some compounds can restore p53, which is a tumor suppressor function, by shifting the structure of p53 back into the wild type conformation. So in some instances, the, the tumor suppressor isn't functional because it's, it's mutated and it's in the wrong structure. And these molecules can bind to it and push it back into the right structure. But it's, it's, it's a rare instance and it's difficult to conceive this as being a widespread solution to replacing the function of a tumor suppressor. Okay, so it's difficult to replace the function of proteins. So tumor suppressors don't make good targets for rational drug design. Now, there's a class of proteins here called caretaker proteins, and I don't think we've used the term caretaker protein in this lecture series. So a caretaker protein, these are proteins that look after the cell. These are proteins that are involved in maintenance of, of, of um, such as DNA integrity. So DNA repair proteins would be a typical caretaker pro protein. So during normal metabolism, DNA gets damaged, and these proteins come in to repair the damage. Now, once you've lost the, the, these repair proteins through whatever means in a cancer cell, you're no longer repairing your genomic DNA. So as the cell um, grows and divides, the genome is not being repaired so that these mistakes are being replicated and further mistakes are not repaired. So there's, it's almost impossible to conceive how a small molecule would replace the function and, and start to instigate DNA repair. Okay, so, so caretaker proteins don't make good targets for, um, for rational drug design. And even if you could repair the protein itself that was repairing the DNA, then in the absence of that protein, there's been an accumulation of damage. So even if you do repair the caretaker protein, the damage has been caused already. So um, not a good target. Now, would oncogenes make good targets? So we've talked about various oncogenes that can be hyperactivated. So one allele of the two genes can be pick up a mutation and that makes it hyperactive. We've made the analogy that an oncogene is like the accelerator in a car and if you're pushing gently on the accelerator you're controlling growth. Once you hyperactivate it you slam down the accelerator and then effectively you're out of control. So would an oncogene make a good target for um, rational drug design. Now, these small drugs are going to be knocking out the effect of a protein. They're going to be inactivating proteins. So if you can inactivate an oncogene, that sounds like a good target. Okay, So oncoproteins become hyperactive 
and um, they 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 um, that they drive cell growth. So they're attractive targets for um, drug therapy because if you can inactivate these proteins by binding a small drug in the catalytic site or something like that, then you're going to knock out that protein, reduce the acceleration, reduce the, the pressure on growth, and therefore return the cell to more like a normal state. So a lot of these um, oncogenes are involved in signal transducing pathways in these, um, these signaling pathways that we discussed in previous lectures. So a lot of these proteins make fairly good targets for rational drug design. And this is just looking at a signaling pathway and then within that signaling pathway it's just showing here in this pink um, purple color the drugs that have been used to target the actual signaling molecules. So let me just refresh your memory of this pathway. If you've listened to the previous lectures, this pathway should make fairly good sense to you. Okay, so the two green parts here are the two um, monomers that are involved in making a tyrosine kinase receptor. Okay, such as you know EGF or or whatever the thing might be. And then here's the signaling molecule that's picked up by the tyrosine kinases. Here's the intrinsic kinase activity that's in on the cytoplasmic tails of these molecules. They phosphorylate the chains and allow the binding of other proteins um, such as GRB2. Okay, so GRB2 contains an SH2 domain. We know the SH2 domain recognizes a phosphorylated tyrosine and therefore we start to pass the signal here onto GRB2 and then onto SOS, which is a guanine exchange factor which activates RAS, so RAS exchanges its GDP, it picks up a GTP, and then it drives the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway. So we've talked about all of this um, last week, and there's a couple of other pathways that lead to RAS activation through SHEC, and then there's a couple of pathways that lead to the activation of, um, of proteins that are involved in um, signaling from phosphatidyl inositol and I haven't got time to explain it here but I've explained it previously. So again you've got these kinases here that are activated through various pathways and these proteins in these signaling pathways that have been documented in normal cell biology and are known to be perturbed in cancer cell biology, these make good targets for drug design. And I'm not going to read them out to you, but you can see here there's a bunch of drugs here that target the receptor tyrosine kinase where the ligand binds. There's a bunch of um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors here that, that bind and inhibit the kinase, which stop the phosphorylation of things, which stop the binding here. Okay, we've got um, we've got some other um, inhibitors here of these. Um, serine threonine kinases that are involved in the mitogen activated protein kinase pathway and a bunch of other targets. So within these signaling pathways that we understand from normal cell biology that we've identified as being perturbed in cancer cell biology, these are proteins involved in driving cell growth. Okay, So the, these pathways drive proliferation, survival, cell cycle progression. If you can, if these are hyperactivated in a cancer then the drug can interfere with that protein to reduce its activity and therefore reduce the pressure on growth, so re to reduce the, um, the, the growth rate of these cancers. Okay, so oncogenes make good targets for rational drug design. I guess when people thought about this, the next question was, well, I know that these pathways are perturbed in cancers, I know early on in cancer these ones are perturbed, late on in cancer these ones are perturbed. So should I be targeting the pathways that are perturbed early on or the ones that are targeted late on? Okay, so it's another thought process. So um, so do the changes um, that occur early um, in this multi-step tumor progression, 
continued to play a role later on in the progression of the cancer. So pictorially, we, we can define a succession of phenotypes. We can define the progression of the cancer from normal cells to um, cells with a slightly deviant phenotype starting to stray away from the normal differentiated characteristic through to these cell types that are looking more malignant and less differentiated and they're starting to get outgrowths. And so as you progress through the, the cancer over what might be many decades, there's, should, we, should you be targeting something that was perturbed early on in a late stage cancer? Like does it, in a, in a cell that's perturbed to this extent, does it still matter if you perturb that gene? Or in these cancers here, do you have to perturb the genes that have recently been mutated? Okay. And this is just a little table looking at the effects of shutting down expression of the initiator oncogenes in, in, in a tumor progression. So this is targeting the early changes in cancers that have progressed to a malignant state. And it's clear that if you target some of these early stage mutations that may have occurred in RAS or some other proteins, then the, the melanomas collapse. It actually helps to knock out the um, cancer phenotype. So you can target early stage mutations that have led to later stage development of the cancer okay and um, sometimes you can get um, persistence or relapse after they shut down some of these early genes and you know there's no simple solution or, or to, to the question but clearly it does make sense to um, to target um, these players in the pathways so Clearly, from this discussion, proteins are the targets for these drug designs. So we're making small, low molecular weight drugs for various reasons in terms of, you know, you can design them fairly straightforwardly. They can get into cells. They're soluble. There's lots of reasons why you design small um, molecules and then you target them for proteins. So low, mole low molecular weight drugs are attractive. They are um, easily easy to synthesize, although being easy should never be a reason to do something over something that's complex, because it's the outcome that is important, not the ease at which you reach that outcome. But um, it, it's, it's, it's more straightforward to make some of these small molecular, molecular weight molecules than it is the high molecular weight molecules. But the small molecular, molecular weight molecules are more likely to be able to penetrate the tumor than the larger molecules. And therefore, um, you're going to see an effect for those molecules. And this is just showing um, Gleevec. This is just a molecule we'll look at a little later. And this is a relatively small, low molecular weight compound, which has been highly effective at treating some cancers. And it was designed through a rational drug design program, rather than a serendipitous discovery of something such as cisplatin.